Hello, and welcome to the Alexander Society, a podcast where we talk about history and use the collective misery of the human race as an excuse to feed our bad habits. Yes, because we cope to drink and we drink to cope. Well, you cope. I'm built different. <laughs> Derek, you're not any better. You were telling about me about how much of a light what you've been like recently. I've been getting better since we've started doing this. And I've... Honestly, so have I. Yeah, I even I even made took the bold step of getting a double shot shot class to use for my shots. I'm not there yet, but I was never much of a liquor shooter. I was always I have something that's super toxic mixed together, like uh, jungle juice esque daiquiri, and then just sip on it for like ten fifteen minutes and get myself another. Ugh, I I need one of Jeff's. Uh, what were those? Were they the daiquiris that he made or? I think I made the last one you had. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, Which, whichever one where, like, I just absolutely could not taste the alcohol at all. That that was me. Jeff usually did the juices. I did the frozen ones. Okay, yeah. Well, you did absolutely phenomenal on that. I got drunk so fast, and I didn't taste a single bit of the alcohol. <laughs> so I'm not going to lie. Those pitchers normally have 10-plus shots in them. Oof. Damn. <laughs> I wasn't joking when I said they're dang near close to a jungle juice, Derek. <laughs> so, Tim, what are you drinking? Uh, so tonight I'm trying Fat Tire for my sipper. I've never had one before. And then I'm going to polish off that Crown Apple. And then if we get too far gone with this week, I put away an 1800 silver tequila as my backup. So my shots, I'm sticking with the classic at this point, my plantation pineapple rum. I'm about uh, halfway through the bottle, it looks like. And for my sips, uh, I decided to bitch out and get some of that Jack Daniels, uh, uh, like peach uh, malt. I think they're malt. Yeah, peach something or other. It's it's. It's just one of those, it's like uh, 4.8% and it tastes... I saw those, I saw a 12 pack at my store with a bunch of the other ones. I will tell you that I think that city shipper, sipper idea I told you about, uh, I think I'm going to go with the hard Mountain Dews on them. Oh man, I saw those at the store when I was grabbing these and I, it's like, it was like finding off-brand four loco. I don't, I didn't know how to feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, that's kind of how i feel about it it's like i know it's gonna be bad but is it gonna be a fun bad or is it gonna be a oh no i'm in the restroom bad i mean hell yeah let's let's both try them for our shitty sippers all right all right so in this podcast we have a set of rules that we abide by the sacred laws of our prestigious organization Rule number one, we take a shot at the start of every episode. So, sip. Cheers. Oh, that's really good. Oh, I needed that. Oh, oh Lord. Rule number two, if if someone dies in our story, we will take a sip. Yeah, because that's how we cope. Rule number three, if we mention someone who is in a previous episode, which we can finally start doing that now that we're in a different topic, we take a sip. Rule number four, if alcohol is mentioned, we take a sip. And rule number five, if there's an event in the story where someone dies and alcohol is involved, then we take a shot. And we do it. I was about to say, do you want to tell our viewers our special rule for this episode since there's not a lot of death? Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, so when I was doing the research for this, even though it's an insanely fascinating topic, it was very devoid of alcohol-involved death. And so I was afraid we wouldn't get many chances to do any shots. One thing that there were plenty of in this story, though, was just insanely badass or inspiring or depressing quotes. Just quotes that add so much texture to the story that I'm glad that we have. So we are implementing a rule special for this topic, rule number six. Whenever we have a quote within our story that I give Tim and the audience, Tim and I are going to vote. 
if we decide that the quote that I have given has made us feel something, anything, if we feel inspired or depressed or horrified, anything like that, then we go ahead and we take a shot. If not, we only take a sip. Sounds good to me, bud. All right. So today we're going to be talking about legitimately, honestly, one of my favorite topics from history of all time. Today we're going to be talking about Friedrich II von Hohenzollern, the Elector of Brandenburg, the Sovereign of the Kingdom of Prussia, arguably the greatest military mind of the eight, of 18th century Europe, and the grandfather of modern Germany. I've never heard of him, but I'm not really a history buff. I don't know much about military leaders or anything like that. Yeah, he's 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 known to history as Frederick the Great. That's what everybody calls him. But even even like Frederick the Great is one of the lesser known names like in history. Unless you have like a vague and vague knowledge of like military history, you probably haven't heard of him. But more I, I wanted to talk about Frederick the Great because I thought that he would serve as a great companion piece to our discussion about Alexander because Alexander and Frederick came from very similar, they came from very similar backgrounds, but approached their entire, like their entire philosophy to life uh, and to rulership and to the military were, all, were just polar opposites. Interesting. And so I think do what? So I assume he was also held as a political hostage as a child, or is that too? Am I thinking too close? Um, you're you're thinking of Philip, um, and oh, I, yeah, that confused me. I always thought that Alexander was the one that was held politically hostage, not Philip. No, it was yeah, it was Philip. Interestingly, Frederick was never held a Frederick was never held as a political prisoner, but. One of his great grandfather, Friedrich Wilhelm, uh, did actually have a similar situation, and we'll actually get to that. But yeah, we actually started off. This is the first time we're going to end up taking a sip before we even get properly into the topic because we mentioned Alexander. So, sip. Whew, that's peachy. No shit, Sherlock. Yeah. But I wanted to talk, I actually, doing this episode, I want to talk more than just about Frederick. I want to talk more generally about Prussia itself. Because it, the story of Prussia itself is a fascinating story on its own. Um, and so even though I'm going to focus on Frederick, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about like the history surrounding Frederick, like before his birth and after his death. Uh, because it's the story of how a relatively minor third-rate power in Central Europe rose from a poor backwater to become the premier military superpower in a time when global European empires were becoming the norm and everybody was a military superpower. <laughs> um, and how it also became the center of global geopolitics for over two centuries. Interesting. And this, this is more or less, the story of Frederick the Great is more or less when that begins. So the sources I used for this series are Iron Kingdom, The Rise and Downfall of Prussia, 1600 to 1947 by Christopher Clark, which is an amazing book. It's ridiculously long. It weighs like two thirds of a pound, but it is such a good, rich, like full history of Prussia. It is so fascinating. Uh, second one was Frederick the Great by Nancy Mitford. It was pretty, pretty short, pretty low on like scholarship, but it's a nice, a nice little general overview of his life. And the third one, the third one I kind of consulted a little bit less was Frederick the Great, King of Prussia by Tim Blanning. You went all over the place for research on this one, didn't you? Oh yeah, I'm I'm trying to get better about like using more diverse sources. Like I said, our story starts well before Frederick's time in the twilight of the Middle Ages. So back then, Germany wasn't a united nation as we know it today. Instead, it was a messy collection of principalities, uh, duchies, and free cities, which were all more 
all more or less fell under the loose authority of an entity called the Holy Roman Empire. You've probably heard that term before, right? I have, but I don't really have context for like what time period it's referring to or all that. Yeah, the, the Holy Roman Empire got its start in like the like its start as in a form that we recognize in like the 10 hundreds, so like the 11th century. And it was finally overthrown by Napoleon in the 18 hundreds. Okay. I would have assumed much, much before that. No, it's it. So half of the medieval period, all the way through like the, through what, what we would call like modernity, like closing in on like modern era. It's, it's, it's a very old and it, it, in all honesty, did not dis it did not go away very long ago. It was 1805 when it was finally abolished. But uh, the Holy Roman Empire was only rarely a coherent government of its own. Uh, the position of the Holy Roman Emperor itself wasn't a hereditary title. It was an elected position. Okay. It wasn't an election like we'd know it today. Not everybody in the empire could vote for the Holy Roman Emperor. So it, was it like kind of like the Electoral College or was this more like a... Okay, these are the elite, they're voting on it. It was even more restrictive than either of those. So whenever a previous emperor would die, there were several powerful noblemen in the empire who were legally vested with the authority to vote on who the next emperor would be. So it wasn't the entire like ruling elite of the empire. It was specifically, like depending on the time period, from anywhere from seven to nine guys. Oh, dang. And these nobles were called the elector princes, or just the electors. One of these electors was the ruler of the electorate of Brandenburg, which was a piece of land in northeast Germany, almost hugging the coast of the Baltic Sea, which had its capital in the city of Berlin, which today is the modern-day capital of Germany, for reasons that we will very shortly get to. <laughs> in 1415... The Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund of Luxembourg granted the electorate of Brandenburg to the ruler, the guy who was ruling the city of Nuremberg. Uh, the guy who was ruling the city had helped him rally the support of the electors to get him elected emperor in 1410. This noble's name was Frederick von Hohenzollern, who became Frederick the First, uh, Frederick the First, Elector of Brandenburg, and was the first in the line of Hohenzollern to rule over Brandenburg. Uh, the lands of Brandenburg itself weren't very rich. A lot of the lands there were either rocky sand or marshland, meaning that it could never have a very extensive farmland, which was the basis for a country's wealth back then. Like, you had to have farmland in order to be rich. Um, it was separated from the sea by the lands of the Duchy of Pomerania, and all of the trade that flowed north, like from the south, from south to north, down the Elba River, stopped off along trading towns in the region of Silesia or in the city of Dresden before it ever made it to Berlin. And so none of the valuable trade from the richer parts of the Holy Roman Empire, like Austria or Bohemia, ever made it to Brandenburg. Okay. I'm, I'm saying all this because Brandenburg, even though it was, it at times it could be politically powerful, it was a very poor region compared to the rest of the empire. It never had many resources of its own. Despite that, though, Brandenburg under the Hohenzollerns was still a political power player within the empire. During the Protestant Reformation of the 1500s, Brandenburg became a prominent center for Lutheranism. And it was well respected throughout the empire for having one of the most peaceful reformations of any part of Germany. So the Reformation was a very violent process. The process like when the Protestant denominations began to split off from the Catholic Church. It started several wars and rebellions and civil conflicts. Uh, and Brandenburg was kind of well-renowned for not having a lot of those problems associated with its uh, conversion from Catholicism into Lutheranism. And so it became a, like a very well-respected and prominent center for Protestantism within Central Europe. Uh, the Hohenzollerns also ruled lands in Western Germany. It wasn't just Brandenburg. There were lands in Western Germany, specifically the Duchy of Cleves, the counties of Mark and Ravensburg, and the bishoprics of Minden and Halberstadt. Also, in 1618, the elector of Brandenburg nearly doubled the amount of land that he had 
by successfully pressing a claim to a huge title in northern Poland called the Duchy of Prussia. To make it complicated, East Prussia, which was the region where the Duchy of Prussia was located, was actually located outside of the Holy Roman Empire. So even though its ruler was an elector prince of the empire, the Duchy of Prussia specifically didn't fall under imperial law. Interesting. Yeah, it's you'll see a lot of very... When you talk, when you learn about the Holy Roman Empire, you see a lot of really confusing situations like that. Like when we get into our actual discussion about Frederick, at the time that Frederick was alive, there were three different electors in the empire that had their own kingdoms outside, outside of the Holy Roman Empire. How how come? Different reasons. Uh, uh, Frederick uh, Frederick inherited the kingdom of Prussia, and so his. His kingdom, even though its capital was within the empire, uh, the main claim of the kingdom, which was the Duchy of Prussia, uh, was outside. And so it was considered like an external kingdom from Brandenburg. It's very complicated. The Elector of Saxony uh, was actually elected to be the king of Poland. And so he ruled over Saxony inside the empire and Poland outside the empire at the same time. And then the Elector of Hanover was also the king of the U- the king of Great Britain. So the king of England was also the elector of Hanover. That feels like like I know that's a modern thing to say, but that feels like a conflict of interest in today's terms. Yeah, it's it it caused a lot of problems. Well, I would have never guessed. <laughs> yeah, and it's going to cause a lot of problems within our story. 1618 that year proved to be a pretty mixed bag for the elector of Brandenburg. And that's putting it very, very mildly. So in 1618, some Protestant noblemen in Prague tossed several representatives of the staunchly Catholic Holy Roman Emperor out of a castle window. Sparking, yeah, it's it's actually got a name. It's referred to as the second defenestration of Prague. Oh, I love that term. I love that throwing someone out the window has its own term, defenestration. No, there's that part, but there's the first word in that, that name the second it had happened before. (laughs) Um, But yeah, the second defenestration of Prague sparked off what became known as the 30 years war. The 30 years war was an extremely complicated conflict that I'm not going to be getting in here, getting into here. Uh, But in general terms, it started out as a conflict between the Protestant princes of the empire and the Catholic princes of the empire who supported the emperor himself. And then from there, it evolved into a larger conflict over power and influence between the different major European powers, including Austria, Sweden, France, and Spain. It was also the most devastating conflict on European soil prior to the First World War. It was an ugly, ugly conflict. The elector of Brandenburg at the time, a man named Georg Wilhelm, or in English, George William, Uh, He was absolutely the wrong man to have in this position at this time. Under any other circumstances, he would have been a fine ruler. He was, he, he, he did fine. He was okay. But Brandenburg was smack in the middle of all of the major belligerents of this war. George William wanted to stay neutral in order to keep Brandenburg out of the war at all costs, because he do like his, his country was too poor to sustain a war effort on either side of the conflict. They would, they would bleed themselves dry trying to get involved. And so he wanted to just stay out of the war. Uh, that lasted for about eight years into the war. They were kind of left alone until a Danish army supporting the Protestant princes invaded itself, invited itself into Brandenburg and occupied it. Pretty soon, just like a couple months after that, they were pushed out by an Aust- by Austrian forces. Then a few years later, in 1630, Sweden entered the war, led by the king of the king of Sweden, Gustavus Adolphus, who incidentally was actually George William's brother-in-law, and also his biological cousin. I'm not really sure how that. It, there's a lot of incest going on here, obviously. But Gustavus Adolphus is a legendary his like military figure in his own right. Like I would love to do an episode about him eventually. If, if I don't end up doing too many episodes on European history, I I really need to branch out. But anyways, George William sent a desperate letter to 
Gustavus Adolphus, begging him to respect Brandenburg's neutrality, Gustavus Adolphus responded with this quote. He said, I don't want to know or hear anything about neutrality. The elector has to be friend or foe. When I come to his borders, he must declare himself cold or warm. This is a fight between God and the devil. If my cousin wants to side with God, then he has to join me. If he prefers to side with the devil, then indeed he must fight me. There is no third way. Damn, that's some cojones. That's... And he backed it up. He fucked up Brandenburg bad. Uh, so that was a quote. What do you think? What? How did that make you feel? I don't know if it's shot worthy, but it's definitely sips worthy. That's my personal vote. What about you? I thought it was pretty badass. I, I thought that it was a good sort like it, I thought it was like a really strong then again I know like about Gustavus Adolphus and I know what he did so it kind of has a little bit more weight to me but since you have more context on this I'll defeat it to you and I'll give you the shot this time but next time we're we're wishy-washy I get to do the call sounds good to me doing a shot then all right Prost. cheers Over the course of the Thirty Years' War, Brandenburg would be occupied by nearly every major army involved in the conflict. And with every occupation, the army would take out their aggression and their poor pay on the locals. So, rapes, looting, torture, massacres, burning, kidnapping, extortion, every bad thing that you can imagine was done to the people of Brandenburg. (laughs) <laughs> and that's a sip. Yeah, I guess that is a sip. It didn't matter who. The Austrians, the Danes, the Swedes, the fellow Germans, even their own army sometimes would do this stuff. Um, to give you an idea of how awful this was, um, I'll give you an example. There was, I'm going to give you the name of one of the methods of torture that was employed by Swedish troops. And I want you to guess what you think that that kind of torture looked like. So it was called, it was nicknamed the Swedish Draught, D-R-A-U-G-H-T. I couldn't even guess. Do you know what a, do you know what a draught is? No, I don't. Like it. It's like when you take a, like a big mix, a big mixed drink that you need to like stir up. Okay. So it's like a cocktail kind of. Yeah. Kind of just, but bigger. Uh, so I'm going to guess that it is some kind of drowning. Hmm. Very close. You're in the ballpark. So I'll give you a quote. This is a quote from a like a public official who served in a town called Baylitz near Berlin, describing the what the Swedish drop draught looked like. Quote The robbers and murderers took a piece of wood and stuck it down the poor wretch's throat, stirred it. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> stirred it. And poured in water, adding sand or even human feces. And pitifully tortured the people for money, as it so transpired with a citizen of Baylitz called David Ertl, who died of it soon after. He didn't die from getting a stick shoved down his throat? Yeah, that's how he died. It just took him a while to die. No, I mean, I would have thought that would have been an instant death, is what I was getting at. No, he would have been alive and conscious for the entire process. It, It was vile. I don't mean disgusting as in like a gross. That's disgusting as in like that's outrageous way to kill someone. That's that. Yeah, I I agree with you. It's very disturbing. So what do you think? Sipper shot. Uh, I guess we go ahead and go a shot because it is a death too. Oh shit! You're right. <laughs> yeah, we're kind of di- we'd be if it's yeah. I guess we can just add this post humorously. If it's a quote about a death, we should go ahead and just make it a shot anyway. Oh yeah, sure. Sounds good to me. That's what I like about this game. We can just make up the rules as we go along. Prost. So by the end of the war in 1648, a full half, a full 50% of the population of Brandenburg had either died or been displaced. Holy crap. 50%. Um, So that's a sip. So, yeah, 50% of Brandenburg. But surprisingly enough, 
Brandenburg did not come out of this war with nothing. In 1640, George William died. That's another sip. <laughs> you weren't kidding about your front loading. I'm already almost done with this first beer. I just opened beer number two. <laughs> so George William died. He was succeeded by his son, Friedrich Wilhelm I, who was able to scrape together a capable army and forge the right alliances in order to put Brandenburg on top. And this is the guy I mentioned earlier, who's kind of like the analog for Philip. Um, during the Thirty Years' War, he spent most of his teenage years in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, and he, was, he wasn't there as a political prisoner. He was just there so that he was away from all of the violence. Um, but while he was there, he would get up every morning and he would go and observe the uh, daily drills of the local garrison regiment of of the Dutch army. Okay. And he that instilled in him this belief that a that what he needed because at the time Brandenburg's army was mostly like local militia forces. And so when he finally rose to the throne, he reformed his army to become like a well drilled, well disciplined uh, fighting force. Uh, like professional fighting force. So he very much believed in like the regimented. You have to train. You gotta, you gotta have discipline. All that kind of stuff on the army. Yeah, he he very he just like Philip. He professionalized his army. That's another sip. <laughs> At the Peace of Westphalia, which ended the war in 1648, Friedrich Wilhelm was actually able to use his connections with France, who he had allied himself with in order to get the Duchy of Pomerania from Sweden. So Sweden surrendered the Duchy of Pomerania to Brandenburg during as a condition for this treaty. Okay. And so Brandenburg ended up at the end of this war, they ended with more land than when they started. Nice. Yeah. Trade half of your population for a few hundred square miles of land. That's a good trade, right? Probably not, but they didn't really have a choice in it. Probably. No problem. Yeah, they really didn't. So over the course of Friedrich Wilhelm's reign, he reformed his army in the style of the Dutch army, like I said, which was professional and highly drilled. And he adopted a diplomatic strategy of just ignoring his treaty obligations. So whenever he'd sign a treaty with somebody, he went into it knowing full well that he didn't plan on keeping any of his promises. And he... He would just side with whoever would ben- give Brandenburg the best deal. He was known to switch alliances two or three times in a single year. Uh, always just going to whoever was offering the best deal to Brandenburg. He made his country an invaluable military asset in Central Europe, proving the power of his new military first at the Siege of Krakow in 1656, and then again at the Battle of Fairbellin in 1675, where he drove out a much larger invading Swedish army out of Brandenburg. Uh, That's a sip because like 7,000 people died. That's a lot of people dead. As an interesting anecdote, when that Swedish army fled from the battlefield, uh, parts of the army that were fleeing were surrounded by local peasants, a lot of whom were old enough to remember the atrocities that the Swedish army had committed during the 30 years war. And they went and they massacred like 500 more Swedish troops as they were running away. Um, I'm not going to actually argue with you, but technically you could probably count those two together. But I'm not going to pass up an excuse to get drunk. Listen, I I just, I need, I need to drink. I just, I need it. Fair. So Friedrich Wilhelm would die in 1688. And after his death, he'd come to be remembered by his nickname, Friedrich Wilhelm the Great Elector. That's what he's known to is in history. If you if you Google the great elector, he'll come up. Okay. He was succeeded by his son, Friedrich III, who was a more inward-looking ruler who sought to reform Brandenburg from internally. He amassed an enormous art collection, and he founded several universities. He was very much a patron of artwork and education, things like that. But he's most famously remembered as the first king of Prussia. He crowned himself Frederick I, King of Prussia, in 1701. Besides that, though, his rule was pretty unmemorable, and most of the impressive things that he did were immediately reversed by his heir, 
his son, Friedrich Wilhelm I. Uh, Friedrich Wilhelm was the polar opposite of his father. He hated ex- all of the expensive pomp of Frederick's court and sold off nearly all of the artwork and artwork and all of the various palaces that he inherited. He was a deeply pious Calvinist, as well as a raving misogynist who believed that high culture and academics were effeminate. He believed that a king should conform to his concept of masculinity. Uh, That is, a man who spends his morning praying and reading the Bible, his afternoons drilling his troops, and his evenings feeding his violent alcoholism. That's another sip. I really think you are trying to get me drunk this time, Derek. I am violently trying to get you drunk. (laughs) On that last point, just as an interesting anecdote, he would host a little meeting with all of his closest friends every night. They would all smoke pipes and get wasted while discussing topics that ranged from I'm not making this up. These are actual examples that are given that ranged from theology and military tactics to what women smelled like during sex. How does one go from those two? When you fetishize masculinity, anything is possible. Yes, but like... If you're talking about your sex stories, I get it. But how do you get from one to the other? What I'm having a hard time. Yeah, you know, these conversations would go on for hours. These little get-togethers were nicknamed Tobacco Ministries. I just I thought that was funny. I thought that was kind of an interesting little anecdote. Also, also drinking sip. Friedrich Wilhelm was obsessed almost to fanaticism with all things military. With all the money that he saved by cutting back on the gaudiness of his father's court, he expanded the Prussian military to unbelievable sizes. Uh, where the Great Elector's Army had capped out at somewhere around 40,000, Friedrich Wilhelm's army got as large as eighty to 90,000. And they were relentlessly drilled until they were probably the best trained soldiers on the continent. Without exaggeration, the best trained in all of Europe. Um, to give you an idea of just how big his army was in comparison to his country, at the same time that he was alive, Britain, which you know was a military superpower in its own right, had a ratio of about one soldier for every 114 people that lived in Britain. Uh, for for Prussia, that that ratio was about one in one in 17. Dang! So for every 17 people in Prussia, one of them was a soldier. Um, Voltaire, who we're going to talk about probably in the next episode, Voltaire once has this really famous quote. He said, "Where most nations have." Where most states have an army, Prussia is an army that owns a state. Didn't he also write, isn't he the attributed with, not necessarily the first originator, of all that it takes for evil to win is for good men to do nothing? I've seen it attributed to him, but I've also seen a lot of quotes attributed to him that he didn't say. So uh, That's why I tried to preface it, because like obviously that that's so generic that it probably could have been just around forever. I didn't I didn't write that uh I didn't write that quote down in the story. I just said it. So I'm not going to require you to take a sip or a shot, but I'm going to go ahead and take one. Friedrich Wilhelm's obsession with the military, it wasn't practical. It it didn't come over from a practical place. It was purely just because he liked the military. He liked uniforms and he liked military science. It it was just his hobby basically. Okay. The best example of that is what's called the Potsdam Giants, or their their actual name was the Potsdam Regiment of Grenadiers, which was a unit in his army. And the entire unit was made up of men who were, I think the shortest was like six, seven. They were all ridiculously tall men. There was about, I think a regiment was like 400 men. And the reason that he was able to have this unit of giants was because he would literally send out agents all throughout Europe, and whenever they'd find somebody, like whenever they find a man who was large enough, uh, they would just kidnap him. That tracks. Yeah, it it's such a ridiculous story. Uh, he actually started. Mul- he almost came into, like, started multiple wars because he would just kidnap random people off the streets of of Vienna or London or Warsaw. Uh, <laughs> 
he adored these guys. So whenever he would be in a carriage riding along, he'd have a couple of, or he'd have like four of these giants uh, walking along the side, holding hands above the carriage. So they'd literally be tall enough that they could reach over the carriage and hold each other's hands, and they just walk along with him. Holy crap! Yeah, they were. Most of these guys were closing in on seven feet tall. And I thought I was tall. Damn. Yeah, yeah. And whenever he was sick or in a bad mood, which was a lot, um, he'd have his giant, he'd have a few of these grenadiers come into his bedroom and just start doing like parade drills. So they'd go through like their um, their manual of arms. They'd, uh, they'd do like marching formations just in the middle of his bedroom. And he'd just lay on his bed and watch it like clapping like an idiot, just laughing along. <laughs> Um, anyways, uh, Friedrich Wilhelm's hatred of academics specifically, uh, was so great that he was barely literate and he didn't know how to write much more than his own signature. You shouldn't take that as a mark against his intelligence though. No, I've never really kind of tangent. I've never seen formal education as a mark of someone's intelligence It because like formal education is something that even if you wouldn't consider yourself privileged is kind of a privilege because some people have to drop out even up until not too long ago, like to support their family or you just don't have the money to go beyond high school or whatever. But I've had some very intelligent conversations with people who have barely finished high school or didn't finish high school. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, and that, that was really the case with Friedrich Wilhelm. He was a very, very intelligent man, especially when it came to military tactics and to diplomacy. He was an absolutely outstanding general and negotiator. His alliances and his maneuvering made him one of the most powerful men in the entire Holy Roman Empire. So powerful, in fact, that the emperor himself started to see the kingdom of Prussia as a threat to his influence in Germany. Uh, Friedrich Wilhelm's wife, Sophia Dorothea of Hanover, had given birth to two sons, Friedrich Ludwig in 1707 and Friedrich Wilhelm in 1710, as well as his daughter, Wilhelmina, in 1709. Both of those sons would die as infants. That's sip. Oh, that, that always sucks, is dying that young. Yeah, they were both right around a year old when they died. But both of those sons would die before their fourth son was born on January 24th, 1712 in the palace in Berlin. They named this son after Friedrich Wilhelm's father. They named him Friedrich. And this son would eventually survive to succeed his father to the throne as Friedrich II, a.k.a. Frederick the Great. After that, Sophia Dorothea would have 10 more children. She had a grand total of 14 kids. 12 of which survived. 14 goddamn kids. 14 kids. That, I can't, I cannot even imagine. It doesn't matter that not all of them survived. This woman gave birth 14 damn times and she didn't die in j- childbirth. I, 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 me, me, brain, no work. Yeah, she was a pretty tough lady in her own right. That That's not just tough. That That's like, she's a badass. Uh, To say that Frederick, now we're actually talking about Frederick, to say that he didn't have an easy childhood would be kind of like saying that Jeffrey Dahmer had peculiar culinary tastes. Oh, goodness. Yeah, it was bad. (laughs) At first, as a child, Frederick and his father had a pretty good relationship. For all of his faults, Frederick Wilhelm had a genuine affection for his children. He genuinely actually loved his children. Uh, even though he had like this hyper masculine sort of thing where he didn't try qu- quite treat them right because he had an idea of how he should raise them, yeah, it start tale is old the time. Toxic masculinity wins again. Yeah, from an early age, he could detect a very sharp intellect from his son. Even as a even as a toddler, he he knew like that Frederick had a certain intelligence to him that would serve him very well as king. The problem started when Friedrich Wilhelm made the mistake that so many fathers have made since the beginning of human consciousness. 
he tried to mold Frederick into a little miniature version of himself. One of Frederick's greatest influences in his early years was his tutor, a French Huguenot. Um, a Huguenots were French Calvinists who were persecuted by the Catholic French throne and driven out of France. And this particular Huguenot was a man named Jacques Duhan de Jandun, uh, who had been an officer in Friedrich Wilhelm's army. The king had given guidelines to what Frederick's education would consist of. He wouldn't learn any classical philosophy. He wouldn't learn any history that wasn't pertinent to the diplomacy he would be doing as king. Most of his studies would consist of military knowledge to include pertinent topics like mathematic. He was to learn absolutely no music or art. And with the exception of learning French so he could easily communicate across everyone in Europe, because back then... Everybody spoke French for some reason. But with that exception, he was to learn absolutely nothing about the French at all. He was he was told to stay at least 80 feet away from anything that might even look French. That sounds very racist. I wouldn't I wouldn't quite call it racist because racist means something specific and this this was just like generic. I, I get what you're saying though. Like yeah, it it's it's more stupid than it is like prejudiced. You have more details on it that I'm just reacting to the what you've informed me. Um, he was also Frederick was also given a strict schedule to follow. He would wake at six. He'd have prayers and scriptures till seven. He'd have lessons with Duhan until eleven. Lessons with the king until two. More lessons with Duhan until five, and then he'd have free time until his bedtime at ten thirty at night. The king probably chose the wrong guy for this job. At least for his intentions. Duhan was an amazing teacher. He taught Frederick very well. Uh, the problem was Duhan wanted to teach Frederick a lot more than what the king prescribed. Of course, that's how it goes. When Frederick was eight, he started to ask Duhan to teach him classical history and Latin, because that's what all eight-year-olds want, is to learn about classical history and Latin. <laughs> of course. Um, Duhan resisted for a little bit, not wanting to incur uh, Friedrich Wilhelm's wrath. Uh, but eventually he relented, but he tried to stay within the king's requirements. And so he decided to start teaching him Latin through the edicts and the laws of the Holy Roman Empire, which were all written in Latin. But when Friedrich Wilhelm found out, he still saw it as disobeying. And he flew into a violent rage and he beat both Frederick and Duhan with a cane. Jesus Christ. That is, yeah, that's going to become much more common from this point on. The king's temper only got worse from there. He suffered from a genetic condition called porphyria, which I'd like to point out is a condition that occurs from inbreeding. Of course. Porphyria gives people migraines, sores, stomach pains. They, the symptoms could leave people bedridden for weeks whenever they flared up. And as Friedrich Wilhelm aged, his symptoms got worse and worse. And as they got worse, so did his temper. And as Friedrich got older, he turned his intelligence into a form of rebellion against his father. He continued to learn about the classics in secret, as well as start, he started reading more recent Enlightenment philosophy, uh, such as Voltaire. That Voltaire is going to actually going to be a pretty big part of the story, surprisingly. I've never actually learned a whole lot of Voltaire about Voltaire. Yeah, I, I figured you'd heard of him since I knew you had a little bit of familiar, familiarity with philosophy. Like, I've heard of him, but I've never heard of his, like, you know, anything detailed, you know? Okay, yeah, he was just, he was a writer of, like, Enlightenment philosophy and social commentary during the eight, the 1700s. That was his main shtick. Okay. By Frederick's early teen years, he had a secret library that his tutor and a local bookseller in Berlin helped him keep. He also got really into French culture and horror of horrors got very into poetry and music. He secretly began to learn the flute and was apparently pretty good at it. So yeah, he would he would he would remain a very passionate flute player for the rest of his life. He'd he'd host like a little I'll talk about this a little bit in the next episode, but he would host like little concerts for all of his closest friends every single night where he'd get like some famous uh musician or composer of the time to come in and just play like a duet with him that's actually badass he'd play his flute like he got um he once played a duet with johann sebastian bach 
Oh, I would like I could die happy if I like played like any kind of duet with a famous artist. Um, and Bach's uh, son would actually be the court uh, composer for Frederick's court for un- for several decades. So yeah, he was he was very passionate about history. He was very good at not like 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 top tier, but he was still pretty good. He could he could hold a tune. He could play with some very skilled musicians. His relationship with his father was constantly strained, obviously, because he loved everything that Friedrich Wilhelm vilified and hated with a burning passion. Um, the king expected Frederick to continue the role. Can, like to carry on Frederick Wilhelm's like tradition of the soldier king, but Frederick didn't seem to be all that interested in military subjects. Uh, he was commissioned as an officer in command of the Potsdam Grenadiers as at like the age of fourteen, I think. He was like he was the captain of the Potsdam Grenadiers, um, but he was very bad at his job and he was chronically late for drills. Uh, one time he was late. And when he arrived an hour late, the king asked him what had held him up, very obviously irritated. And Frederick responded by saying that he'd felt especially pious that morning and he'd spent an, some extra time praying after he woke up. Uh, which obviously the king the king knew he was bullshitting, but he couldn't be mad about it. And that's kind of how most of their conversations went. Frederick would say or do something that would defy his father's will. And he'd just use his cleverness to kind of shuffle around it using the king's own logic. Um, he was a world-class smartass. Just a top-tier smartass. He was insanely sarcastic with everything that he did and said. And it drove his king, it drove his father just up the wall constantly. And because because the king could never argue with any of the stuff that he said, because he just, he didn't, he didn't hold a candle to to Frederick's intelligence. He, it just resulted in him flying into these rages and beating Frederick. So so he always carried around this cane with him, and whenever whenever he got upset or angry at something, he'd just start beating someone with it. And more often than not, that was Frederick. And during those times, the only person that he had to confide in was his older sister Wilhelmina. Um, a lot of people say that they were so close that they were more like twins than like an older sister and a younger brother. They were completely inseparable for pretty much their entire lives. In 1728, tensions between Prussia and Poland, which was ruled by King Augustus II, who incidentally, like I mentioned before, was also the elector of Saxony. Um, In order to smooth things over, Friedrich Wilhelm and Augustus announced that they would be hosting the Prussian king for a state visit in Dresden, which was the capital of Saxony. The king brought the 16-year-old Frederick along for his first taste of geopolitics. Augustus had nearly bankrupted the Saxon state, buying art and building theaters to make Dresden the cultural capital of the Holy Roman Empire. The Dresd- I, I can't emphasize enough, Dresden, Dresden has the same reputation in the, in the 18, 18th century that Paris had in like the 19th and 20th centuries. It was it was one of the most culturally and art- artistically and be, just any sort of culture, the most sophisticated city in all of Europe. Frederick, when he visited Dresden, was immediately smitten with it. He dined at lavish feasts and attem- attended elaborate dances. He saw his first opera, which would remain, opera would remain one of his great passions for the rest of his life. And despite his conserv- and despite his father's conservative attitude, Friedrich Wilhelm had a blast too, and he got crazy drunk partying almost every single night. Visiting Augustus, just because Augustus was such a good host and threw such great parties, um, that was one of the few things that could actually put uh, Friedrich Wilhelm in a good mood and calm his temper. And for the month that they were in Dresden, he didn't lash out or become angry or upset even once. Uh, But Augustus, who was notorious for his joking and his pranks, decided to pull one on the Prussian king. After dinner one night, the Polish king led all of his guests into a back room where a big curtain had been put up. Once everybody's attention was on the curtain, it was pulled down to reveal a woman, completely naked, reclining on a couch. Because Augustus knew 
how devoutly pious and conservative Friedrich Wilhelm was. And when the Prussian king's delicate religious sensibilities were offended, he rushed from the room, dragging Frederick with him. Frederick, for his part, was, shall we say, deeply interested in the woman, and he resisted leaving the room. (laughs) Keep in mind, he was like 16. Oh, good God, that's actually creepy. Uh, the reason I bring up this weird story that doesn't have any like relation to like the long arc of his life is because it helps me segue into one of the most contentious discussions about Frederick's life, that being his sexuality. Frederick, in all likelihood, almost certainly, was almost definitely gay. Interesting. And throughout his life, he would carry on relationships with several men. Even though we don't have documented evidence of physical relationships, uh, the letters that he sent were often filled with explicitly romantic and sometimes even erotic messages. Dang. However, like I mentioned with Alexander in the last episode, by the way, sip, like I mentioned with Alexander, uh, academics are not always keen on their historic heroes having sexual attractions that they find unsavory. Of course not. This incident in Dresden has been cited as proof that Frederick was actually attracted to women. There's even a story that's even recounted as fact in one of the biographies that I read that in, that he ended up having an affair with the woman on the couch. He's 16. He doesn't know himself. Do you know how many gay men I know that have had sex with women like for years that finally, like, I know why it never worked out. I always gay. Yeah, that yeah, and that's that's exactly that's what I think was going on here. There's absolutely no proof that this affair took place. What I believe was happening, like you mentioned, why he wanted to stay and ogle this poor woman was that he was closeted, he was repressed, and he was a hormonal teenager encountering s- something resembling sexuality for the first time in his entire life. Yeah, this this is absolutely not proof that he was straight. And it would, if, if this was an example of him expressing like a very heterosexual attraction, it would run completely counter to all of the well-documented relationships that he would have for the rest of his life. So yeah, that, that's my piece on that. Anyways, this trip to Dresden would be the high point of Frederick and his father's relationship. Once they got back to the king's, once they got back to Berlin, the king's endless bad mood returned and the beatings and insults intensified. Around that time, Friedrich Wilhelm found out about Frederick's secret library and had it sold off. What was in the secret library again? Um, just a bunch of books about like classical and Enlightenment philosophy, mainly. Okay, so it wasn't like anything to be ashamed of. It was just his dad was a dick. During one particularly bad beating, his father said to him, and here's another quote, If my father had treated me as I treat you, I would have killed myself or run away. Is this giving him ideas? Yeah, actually, it's giving him ideas. (laughs) (laughs) So what do you think? Sipper shot to that absolutely fucking banger of a quote from this guy's father. Just A1. I feel like it's a sipper. Not because, like, oh, it's not good or anything. I just feel like the guy was being stupid. He doesn't deserve a shot in his honor. Yeah, just some A1 top tier parenting. I you love to see like a strong dominant father figure. Don't don't you love it? Um, so Frederick, ever the smartass, like you said, he took it as a challenge. <laughs> yep. Yeah. He he was not the kind of guy to kill himself, but he did start making plans with two of his friends. One of his friends was a guy named Hans Hermann von Katte, who was a few years older than him. This guy was the commander of the Royal Gendarmes, who were like the, they were like mounted military police in Berlin. And another friend named Peter Karl Christoph von Keith, who was a cadet learning under Friedrich Wilhelm. And they made a plan to escape from Prussia and seek asylum in England. They were going to run away? In July... They were going to run away. They were going to just completely leave Prussia behind forever. I don't figure that turns out well with them. Oh, it, it does. Oh, 
Oh my god, you have no idea how bad it's going to get. I'm going to take a sip in anticipation, because that doesn't sound good. In July of 1730, Frederick Wilhelm set off on a tour of Germany in order to pay visits to several of the princes around the empire, just as like, you know, standard diplomatic visits. And he brought Frederick along with him. Frederick's plan that he'd formulated with his two best buddies in the world was to slip away with von Kata, buy a couple horses, flee to the Netherlands, and then take a ship to London. Solid plan for the time. Yeah, it probably would have worked out all right if it hadn't been for the fact that both Frederick and von Kata were both not being very secretive about it. Um, they would just openly brag about it to anybody who they thought wasn't like in regular contact with the king. If you're running away, you don't tell anyone but the person you run away with. Jack shit. That's the rules. And so inevitably rumors made it back to the king. Something else I should mention here is that it is very likely that Frederick and Von Kate were in a relationship. Hell yeah. We love our gay kings. Um, of course, as with all of the relationships that Frederick would have, there is no concrete evidence that it was a full physical relationship. It was not mentioned anywhere, and it wouldn't be mentioned anywhere because that was a blasphemous crime back then. But it's pretty clear from both of their own correspondence and of contemporary sources describing their relationship that there was some sort of romantic dimension to it. And regardless of like the actual nature of their relationship, they were very, very close. They, I, so kind of off topic. I feel like his, like historically, if you say, Oh, they were friends, they were roommates, stuff like that. If there's a strong relationship, you know, pre-established all that. And it goes on for many years historically, Unless, like, both people are in, uh, like, a very public relationship, I feel like it's more likely than not something happened nowadays if we look back on it. Because we're just, like, uh, a lot of modern pro people who look at history just tend to be like, oh, it was a friendship, nothing more. If you have that kind of relationship that long back then, I feel like it was much easier to cross the line into physical just because you didn't have anything else, you know? I think, yeah, I, I think I know what you're getting at. Yeah, could you elaborate a little bit? Uh, so what I'm getting at is basically, like, back then, not if no one was in a committed relationship, I feel like it was more easy for them to be like, oh, we just fucking on the side until one of us gets into a relationship. Actually, back then, it was kind of expected, at least for the men, that once you were, even when you were married... It's actually, especially once you were married, it was kind of expected that you'd have someone on the side, even if it wasn't publicly acceptable. So you're saying drunk me is like onto something? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, because back then marriage, it was it was always understood back then that marriage had little to nothing to do with love. It was purely a business or a political arrangement. Um, there's actually a a famous quote by the Archbishop of Canterbury in, I think it was like the early 1800s, he said, marriage is for business, love is for an affair. Yeah, honestly, um, even up until quasi recently in history, you used to see like, oh, this, like, and sometimes even now, the marriage isn't really for love. It, it It's to achieve a goal. You, you're not there for, to find your soulmate. Yeah, that. I mean, not not to get into like some radical like like some radical feminist theory about like an, like anti marriage stuff, but there is a certain extent where marriage is simply just a business arrangement. It's formalizing it's formalizing a relationship, whether there is actual like actually a romantic attraction or not. Uh, so I'm not speaking of like marriage in the sense of like okay, it's a relationship. I'm speaking as the legal document that it's literally just a saying, hey, government. I am relation for the ship with this person. Please give me tax incentives. That's all marriage really is nowadays. Personally, yeah, like in a lot of, a lot of senses, even if a marriage like genuinely is for love, that that love and that connection and that promise to like stick with like two people to stick with each other for the rest of their lives exists pretty much independently from the decision to get married. In a lot of ways, yeah, no, like. I personally, other than the commitment, like 
yes, we still have a little bit of the, this is a sanctity thing. This is like blah, 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 whatever you want to call it for the union of marriage of like, this is our finally commit, commit together. I don't see marriage as having like the same context as it did many years ago. Like, oh, this is supposed to be a real thing. No, that it's just like a legal document to me. If you're committed to your partner, you're committed to your partner. You're not going to step outside of that. Yeah, I agree with you. So around the time that Friedrich Wilhelm and his party, remember, they're on this they're on this trip around Germany that making these just diplomatic visits. Friedrich Wilhelm and his party arrived in the court of the Elector Palatine, who was the ruler of a region called the Palatinate. And the Palatinate was just one of those elector titles. So he was called he was called the Elector Palatine. It's it's a it's a weird naming conviction convention compared to the other electors. Um, and while they were there, uh, their friend von Keith had lost his nerve, and he told the king the entire plan. And so Frederick and von Kata were placed under arrest. And when they returned to Brandenburg, they were both in prison it in the fortress at the town of Kustrin. He also had Frederick's sister, Wilhelmina, put under house arrest. But before he did that, he beat the absolute crap out of her. And also, in a rage, he nearly killed several of his younger children. He, he just, when he returned to Berlin, he just went on like a rampage. He, he beat several of his children. He had several of his servants like flogged. A couple people, like, um, like the guy who was... There was a guy who was loaning Frederick money so he could buy books. Um, Friedrich Wilhelm found out about him and would have had him killed if it weren't for the fact that he was able to escape. Yeah, he was. He had never been more furious than he was in his entire life than he was in that moment. Wow. And for some context, I need to explain the political situation between Prussia and Britain because it's, it's relevant. The king of Britain, George II, was also, incidentally, Friedrich Wilhelm's cousin. He was also, as I mentioned earlier, the elector of Hanover. Prussia and Britain at the time were on the brink of war because there had been several incidences between the army of Hanover and the Prussian regiments in the West German regions of Cleve and Mark that I I mentioned earlier. They owned some land in West Germany. And those regions of Cleve and Mark shared a border with Hanover. Frederick trying to flee to Britain wasn't just a teenager running away from home. It had political consequences. He was an officer in the Prussian army who was attempting to defect to an enemy of his kingdom. What he was doing was legally treason. So both Frederick and von Katze were charged with desertion and treason. Dang. Frederick Wilhelm was seriously considering having Frederick executed. He was actually like tossing around the possibility of doing it, but he was convinced to, to spare his son's life by several of his generals who correctly pointed out that that would look really bad and might, might have some diplomatic consequences. And he was also sent a letter by the Holy Roman emperor, basically saying you're not allowed to execute your son he is legally a prince of the Holy Roman Empire and falls under the law of the Holy Roman Empire. So it would not be it would not be legal of you to execute him. And besides that, Friedrich Wilhelm still, in spite of all of this, he still believed that Frederick had the potential to be a really good king. He still recognized like a very deep, genuine intelligence and a potential that he had for rulership. The thing was, he wanted to, he wanted the crown prince brought under his boot. He thought that it would only be possible to mold him into a good king if he could bring him to heel. So he decided that he would send Frederick a message that he would never forget. On the morning of November 6, 1730, Hans Hermann von Katte, who was, again, very likely the love of Frederick's life, was brought out into the courtyard of the fortress at Kustrin in full view of Frederick's cell window. And while the prince was watching, von Katte was executed by beheading. Ah, fuck. And that's a sip. Spear number two. According to the sources, as von Katte was being led out, Frederick shouted from the window, quote, Please forgive, my dear, please forgive me, my dear Katte. In God's name, forgive me. 
To which Kata responded, there is nothing to, to forgive. I die for you with joy in my heart. There's no way that wasn't a sexual relationship. There's no way that they were. You you don't say that to anyone, but you're like, you're, you're, I, I want to say lover, but like more than that, but someone that you share deep thoughts, not just had sex with. Like you, this is your partner. This is someone that you planned on being with for a long time. Yeah. Like regardless of whether or not their relationship was romantic and sexual, that's the kind of relationship where you're like joined at the hip for your entire lives. Uh, so what do you think? Sip or shot? It has to be a shot, but like I'm already gone. Um, I'll I'll take it easy on you. I'll take a shot and I'll let you take a sip. How's that sound? Uh, we'll call what I, let, little I, I don't didn't have a full shot left in my whiskey, so we'll I'll take that and then we'll call it good. It's not a full shot. And here's some uh, here's some more fucked up shit. Frederick actually didn't see Von Kata's death because just as the sword was being brought up, about to be brought down on brought down on Von Kata's neck. He passed out. He literally passed out before he before the sword actually came down. He was so shocked by what he was seeing. And for the rest of his life, Frederick would never once talk about Von Kata ever again. That's some PTSD. Oh yeah, he was definitely traumatized by this. I, I bet you that it it messed with him hard. It, that there's no way that that didn't like traumatize him for good. Yeah. And that's that kind of gets to another comparison that I have between Frederick and Alexander is that is their relationships to their fathers. If you if you remember Alexander's relationship to Philip was very much one of they saw each other more as competitors or rivals like rivals for power than they ever saw each other as father and son but in frederick and friedrich wilhelm's case it was this awful horrible confluence of like a genuine affection that they had for one another and the pressures of their own ideas of how frederick's life should be coming into like this horrible conflict and for the rest for Frederick's entire life, even long after his father had died, he would constantly be trying to please his father. And it, he, he'd even talk about it openly with like his, his confidants. He, he'd, he'd mentioned like, I bet my father would be pleased. Like after he won a battle or something, it was always to the day he died. It was on his mind. I, and, and whenever he had failed, like if he lost a battle, he would have nightmares where his father was uh, beating him and telling him how disappointed he was. That honestly sounds like he's trying to one-up his father, not make him proud. In a sense, yeah, it, but it, it could be both. Um, trying to surpass what his father did, both to make his father proud and to prove his father wrong. It's like the purest the purest essence of the idea of a love hate relationship. I mean, you're not wrong. And it's easily the most tragic aspect of Frederick's personality of his life and who he was as a person was that he was to the day he died. He was never able to shake this obligation. He felt to be better than his father to always have his father's ghost like breathing down his neck. And it really, in a very real sense, it started with this. Um, so after Von Kata's execution, the king began a period of reconciliation with Frederick. And by reconciliation, I mean that he had completely broken Frederick and the prince went along with whatever it is that his father wanted. In August the following year, Frederick made a public apology which involved falling to his father's feet and kissing his shoes. After that, the king started him on a crash course of touring around the country, learning about government and economy by visiting like civil government buildings and local industries. So he's, he's starting to learn how to be a king now. He's learning the finer like bureaucratic points of kingship. So he's really getting the, uh, 
okay, you're my successor training kind of stuff. The final step of their reconciliation was Frederick's marriage. Several years earlier, a general and his close friend, a, a guy who was, he was a general in the Prussian army, and he was a close friend of the king. His name was Frederick Wilhelm von Grumkov, who in all likelihood was probably being heavily bribed by the Austrian government. And alongside him was an Austrian diplomat, diplomat named Friedrich Heinrich Reichsgraf von Seckendorf. These two men had used their influence in court to disrupt a plan that Friedrich Wilhelm had to betroth Frederick and his sister Wilhelmina to two children of the King of England. Uh, that effectively would have put an end to the brewing conflict between Prussia and Hanover. Instead, they put forward the candidates that the Austrian Habsburg Holy Roman Emperor preferred. For Frederick, this meant a marriage to Duchess Elizabeth Christine of brunswick wolfenbüttel bevern who was the daughter of the Duke of Brunswick. I'd also like, I just kind of wanted to point this out or mention this real quick. Um, my family, my German family, actually comes from Brunswick. So your family was directly affected by that many generations ago? Yeah, like my 12 or 13 great-grandfather lived under uh, the people we're talking about right now. Damn. I, I thought that was cool. I wanted to throw that out there. And so Frederick and Elizabeth Christine were married on June 12th, 1733. Frederick was 21, and Elizabeth Christine was 17. Shortly after their wedding, Frederick was given a palace to live in, in the city of Rheinsburg. And now that he had a level of independence, he dived back into reading and music like he loved. Well, no shit. <coughs> and that was pretty much how he lived for the next several years. And not much was going on in his life. He was just learning how to be king under his father. In the meantime, the relationship between Prussia and Austria had slowly begun to break down. The Holy Roman Emperor Charles VI had begun to pursue a policy of containment against the Hohenzollerns. Whenever the emperor had an opportunity to rule on a case against the Prussian king, he took it, and he gave legal to support to Prussia's rivals throughout Germany. The thing that finally tipped Friedrich Wilhelm's opinion of Austria over was in regards to uh, Friedrich Wilhelm's claim to a land title in Western in Western Germany, the du the Duchy of Berg. So it's a region. It's B E R G. It's just called Berg. Okay. The emperor had promised to support Friedrich Wilhelm's claim to the title, but when the living Duke of Berg finally died, the emperor supported somebody else's claim instead. When the Austrian diplomat came to the court in Berlin and informed the king. He flew into a rage of expletives and curse words. Pr the Prince Frederick was actually present as this happened, and the king's tirade culminated in the king pointing to Frederick and telling the diplomat, quote, Do you see that man there? There is the man who will avenge me. I feel like it's supposed to be more of a dramatic than it is. Like, I get the depth he's going for, but it just doesn't land for me. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. I thought it was pretty dramatic. I'll settle for a sip, though. I don't know. I, I don't think I've mentioned it yet. But a lot of these quotes that I'm, I'm, I've taken from the text that I've read, they are actually quotes that you can also find in the... There's a metal album. It's one of my favorite albums of all time uh, that actually inspired me to read more about Frederick the Great and inspired this episode. It's by a band called Judicator. Yeah, the album is called Sleepy Plesov. And a lot of these quotes are actually in some of the songs that they do in this album. Oh, damn. I guess I guess have to listen to Judicator now at least once. Yeah. Sleepy Plus Off. It's, it's a really good album. It's a little bit less polished, but it's still like amazingly good. Is it one of their early albums or? Yeah, it was like their second album. Okay. So it, get, it, it gets a little bit of a pass for being less polished, like you said. Yeah, it was it was an album that never once saw like if you remember it never saw a studio. I actually talk. You know more about this band than I do. I don't know a lot. Um, yeah, this like the first two albums were completely recorded and mixed, just like in their in, like in the 
in the passenger seat of their cars. Not their garage in their cars? Oh, uh, it's like, like, damn. Yeah, it's like recorded in gar- garages and like the the guy who did the mixing like did it in CC's parking lots and shit, shit like that. <laughs> That's impressive, to be honest. I'm going to I'm definitely gonna have to check them out. Oh, it's so fucking good. Anyways, um, so the following year, Friedrich Wilhelm signed a secret alliance with France against Austria in which they would join forces against the Holy Roman Emperor and France would recognize Prussia's ownership to Berg. The year after that, 1740, the king's illness got worse and he rested in his deathbed. In his final address to Frederick, he warned the prince against, against trusting Austria and told him that Austria would just constantly be trying to diminish, like diminish the standing of, of Prussia would, that was, that would always constantly be their goal. On May 31st, 1740, Frederick Wilhelm died at the age of 51. And Frederick, who was 28, was crowned King Frederick II of Prussia. Bastard piece of shit is dead. Let's take a sip. According to some of the sources that I read, Friedrich Wilhelm, Friedrich Wilhelm's last words were, I die happy to leave such a worthy son and successor. So with the way you've t- talked about their relationship, do you think that, one, he actually said that, and two, if he did, it was genuine? In the last 10 years of his life, there he did. there was like a genuine reconciliation between the two men. Okay. Like they they like genuinely had by the end of his life, Friedrich Wilhelm genuinely had like a shared affection with Frederick. It was a long process of like getting back to a point where they could like be friendly and be fatherly again. Um but it it by the end of his life, like they had reached a point where they did have that kind of affection. And he did genuinely believe that he was leaving his kingdom to a, a, a very effective heir. Good. Um, kind of good. It was mainly, uh, mainly because Friedrich had kind of been traumatized into like just agreeing with whatever his father wanted. Oh, so this wasn't actually like an built good. It was more of a, okay, the circumstances resulted in a quote unquote good relationship with, um, there was, I think there was a, like an act, like actually a good relationship between them as good as you could have considering that your father had murdered your, the love of your life in front of your eyes. So it was a mix of like Friedrich Wilhelm genuinely thought that he had, that he was like a good person and a good leader. And partially that, uh, Friedrich Wilhelm was kind of behaving that way out of like a benign sort of internal terror of what his father could do. It's, it's a very complicated situation. There's nothing like simple about trying to explain this. No, I get that, that to be absolutely fair, no one's relationship with their parents is simple. Like there are points where you absolutely hate your parents, but they're still your parents. There's absolutely points where, you love them. They're, they're your parents. You wouldn't do anything to change them, but it doesn't mean you don't have moments where you absolutely can't stand them for that period of time. And for what it's worth, uh, Frederick would have nothing but good things to say about his father for the rest of his life. Um, whenever he discussed his father, he would talk about what a capable leader he was and what an effective father he was. So it is a very complicated relationship. Frederick's first few months as king were extremely eventful. He was finally able to put all of his illicit alignment education into practice. One of the first acts that he put into law was to outlaw the was the outlawing of torture as a form of interrogation in legal cases. That's very progressive of him. That is extremely progressive. Um, rel- you know what? That deserves a sip, in my opinion, because that's super, super advanced for him. There's also, I've read somewhere that he also repealed anti-sodomy laws, but I haven't been able to find that in many sources. And it also kind of sounds like it goes along with some of the other like 
nastier rumors that were kind of said about him. Like, like somebody made it up as, as a way of vilifying him. Like, so back then that probably would have been an insult that was spread around as a rumor rather than, okay, that's actually something good. He did. Right. Like there was another story that he, um, uh, that a case was brought before him about a man who was being tried for, I'm not sure what law exactly it would be, but he had sex with a donkey and he was being tried in a court and the court, the case was brought before him and he actually signed a pardon for the man, uh, basically saying, I, I expect, uh, I expect freedom of conscience for all of my subjects. Why would I not expect, or why would I not also demand freedom of, for what they do with their penis? So that it's another story that is almost definitely not true, but is kind of spread about him to kind of not even necessarily like in a, in a, in a malevolent way, just kind of like exaggerating, like a real, really an actually real thing about how progressive and uh, like, well, liberal his legal reforms were. And so it's possible that like the idea, like the rumor about him uh, decriminalizing sodomy was, another aspect of that does that make sense yeah definitely um so yeah he outlawed torture uh religious toleration was enshrined into law which was on his part it was purely practical because if he had his way he would have just banned all religions from his kingdom he hated religion he despised religion in all its forms if he could just get rid of religion just with a stroke of a pen he would have done it in a heartbeat uh, but he couldn't do that, and so he did the next best thing, which is just religious toleration and having the state not prefer one religion over another. Um, he lifted the state. He lifted state censorship of books and printed media. Um, he even actually developed like a primitive form of social wel- welfare. So during the winter of 1740, there was a bad food shortage in Brandenburg. And he actually opened up some grain silos that had been set aside for feeding the army and opened them up so that anybody who was hungry could freely take from it. Damn. It sounds like he was way ahead of his time. Yeah, he was he was the darling of Enlightenment philosophers in his time. He is the epitome of... Have you ever heard the phrase enlightened despot? Um, it was... Enlightened desperate is a term used to describe, like kings who embodied like the enlightenment philosophy of the 1700s and he was he was the stereotype of the enlightened despot um he also started several of his now legendary building projects including the construction of the opera house in berlin which at the time was the largest freestanding opera house in all of europe and he reopened the universities that had been closed by his father and he heavily funded their operation he even I was I was kind of confused by the way that the book described it, but as far as I could tell, he actually also implemented like the first program of mandatory public schooling in European history, like for all of his citizens, even non nobility, um, which was very ambitious, but wasn't actually very effective because he didn't really have the mechanisms available to implement it universally throughout all of his lands. But still, like there were a lot of like public schools opened up for just like regular everyday people, um, which is very impressive on its own. It's like, insanely ahead of the curve. You're not wrong. Yeah, Frederick had a philosophy that was informed by his interest in Enlightenment thinkers. He believed first and foremost. He he believed that a king first and foremost was a servant of a, of the state. And that the welfare of the state was the primary goal of any ruler. That was, of course, in contrast to the absolutist rulers that were common in that period. The the idea that was embodied by the famous quote by the by the French King Louis the Fourteenth. He said, "I am the state." Dang, I, I I I'm not familiar with a lot of quotes from that time. Yeah, at the time, um, the 1600s and the 1700s were a period of of political centralization. It was a time when the when the authority of the landed nobility was being curtailed and centralized into the power of the sovereign. So kings and emperors were becoming more powerful than their than the landed nobility. And 
uh, so there was a genuine, like, there's a very popular idea at the time that the sovereign of a kingdom should embody in his own person the entirety of the state, uh, the entirety, like the government was the man. And in the Enlightenment thinkers, like the neoclassical Enlightenment philosophies, very much like dr- like pushed against that idea. They emphasized that the state was its own entity separate from any one person or any one body. And, and Frederick's interpretation of that was the king is first and foremost a servant of the state. Every citizen of a nation is a citizen of the state, and the king is the first and foremost servant of the state. It is his responsibility to lead the of the rest of the nation in service to the state. That's very progressive for the time. Yeah, it, it to see it actually put into practice at in the 1700s. I mean, that's that's an idea that a lot of countries didn't even really pick up until the 1900s. I'm not gonna lie, some countries. St- Still haven't gotten it correct. I know he didn't have it, if we want to say modernly correct, but for back then, you can't even fault him. Yeah, I have my criticisms of the framework and the philosophy personally, but but yeah, it was definitely a step up from what they had before. <laughs> no, I mean like modernly, yes, you can obviously criticize him and you could say, well, he could have done this better and that better. But if you look at it historically, could you really expect a whole lot more from him for in historical context no like that yeah like as far as intellectual development have gone had gone he was on the cutting edge of like social theory and he put it into practice very effectively and that's part of what made him so great was not that not just like the battles that he would win and the military victories he would win which were very impressive on their own but once he was done when he got back home he could capitalize on those victories and and make his own society that much more powerful and coherent. That that was one of the great skills that he was able to implement and put into practice. But yeah, as, as another interesting contrast between Alexander and Frederick, like as as you recall, Alexander believed himself to be the absolute ruler, not only of his kingdom, but of everything that he laid his eyes on. Oh, they're t- they're completely opposites in the spectrum, in my opinion. Yeah, complete opposites. Alexander was con- completely convinced of his own divinity, and he made no distinction between like active political power and his own will. Frederick instead saw himself as the head of a huge body, which worked to support the greater spirit of the state. And he recognized himself as a leader with responsibilities rather than Alexander, who saw himself as a leader who was owed the world by virtue of his title. And I think that that's one of the greatest like com- like contrasts that we can make between Frederick and Alexander is just the approach that they had to leadership. Frederick was first and foremost a man with responsibilities and duties, whereas Alexander was to himself a man who was owed things and it made all the difference um mentioned alexander so i'm gonna go ahead and sip damn you're damn near got me on about to start beer four but despite all of his rapid accomplishments his mind was still on his father's last warning it was on the threat that austria posed to the standing of prussia he wanted to strike fast to knock the holy roman emperor down a peg and assert Prussian authority, and he very quickly got his opportunity. On December 17th, 1740, just six months after being crowned the King of Prussia, he took an army of 27,000 into the Austrian province of Silesia and sparked off the War of Austrian Succession. Uh, Remind me again how old he is at this time? 1740, 28 years old. Okay. Okay. And that's where we're going to leave off for now. All right. So what are, you, what are your thoughts so far? What do you think about Frederick? I'm genuinely impressed at him. Like, obviously, by modern standards, he's not up to snuff if you lean the way we lean. But, like, for historically, I ain't got a single issue with him. Like, he, he sounds like he's moving his people in a very progressive, a very caring about those 
who can't care for themselves, to be honest. Yeah, and we're we're going to talk about more of like his personality flaws and the falls and the flaws in the way that he ruled in the next episode. Um, but at least in comparison to Alexander, holy shit, he's a breath of fresh air. <laughs> oh no, he's he's quite literally the stark contrast of Alexander. Yeah, and as I see it, Alexander was the horror was the pain that he he himself inflicted onto the world. And with Frederick, the the horror is the pain that was inflicted onto him. Yeah. And even saying that, we're going to get into some pretty shitty stuff that he did in the next episode. Especially in regards to Poland. Ugh, it's, mm. I feel like any ruler that's not a modern person... No, I take that back. Any ruler is going to be faced with hard decisions that they feel like they have no choice but to make. And a lot of the time, lives are going to be lost during someone's rule. It doesn't matter if it's like a current president, because we have drone strikes via the U.S. It could be Alexander the Great, an old king, because he was just like, I got to take over the world. What I see is what I need to have. You got to take it in a stride and look at it from, I know it's not smart, because the people can't really, you know, sympathize with that in a normal sense like yes your your ruler your king your president is doing supposedly what's best for you but they're still doing horrible things but at least at least you have the only uh the only consolation there is that they're doing what they believe is best for the people at the time whether or not they're right yeah with i I'll kind of push back on that in regards to Alexander. He never gave a shit about it. Yeah. No, 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 no. No, Alexander is an exception. But they're, the people's perception of that. Another big contrast that I'd like to... Between Alexander and Frederick that I'd like to make with this series is that at the end of everything, when everything's all said and done, you can at least say about Frederick that you can sympathize with him even if you don't even if he did some awful horrible things which is just part and parcel with political power you end up doing some awful horrible things at the very least when all things all of it's said and done you can sympathize with frederick and i would even venture so far and in the political circles that i kind of walk in this would be kind of controversial to say but I would even venture to claim that Frederick at least even had his heart in the right place. And I, we're going to see a bit more of that in the next, next step, this uh, episode with more of the stuff that he does uh, at home. And as we explore more, his personal faults and his failings. Um, but at the end of his life, he is going to be, in a happier and more personally satisfied position with himself than Alexander was. Oh, uh, it's not that hard, probably. Yeah. Yeah. At, at the very least, Frederick isn't going to die with any regrets. And if nothing else, we can say that. But we'll get... That's a lucky man. A man who can die without regrets. But we'll get to that in the next episode of our podcast. Tim, do you have any pluggables? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Tim, a.k.a. Otis. Where can they find you, Derek? Uh, they can find me on Twitter at Visigoth. The I is a one, the O is a zero. Uh, come follow me for, I mostly talk about politics, but I sometimes talk about history. Uh, it's up to you, though. I don't give a shit. You can find uh more if you would like to interact more with our podcast you can find us on twitter and i mean facebook and instagram at the alexander society pod and then on twitter at alex society pod you got anything else for him derek no i think we're ready to sign off all right if you enjoyed today's episode please let us know by leaving a rate or review on your uh podcasting app of choice and we hope you have a great week and we hope to see you next time yeah, see you next time